So it's been well documented that the history of feminist struggle has given rise to ongoing problematics of unity and separation. A series of movements between affirming and organizing around a common unified political identity, an example being women, obviously, and then the subsequent negation of that identity through its extension, but also its internal differentiation. Within emancipatory forms of politics, such wages of unity affirm a cohesive shared narrative of subjugation for a social group which is able to target those aspects of what they must posit as a so-called larger society which reproduce and benefit from such subjugation. So while liberal feminism has been criticized for orienting itself around a kind of bad universalism, a formal equality. Sexual difference feminism of, for example, the Italian feminist movement of the 1970s to 80s, affirms a common identity through self-relating women's groups against the wider patriarchal society, effectively producing a theory of a kind of ontological difference via the category of gender. Marxist feminism, obviously, and to all us, obviously, appears to offer the potential for the contextualization and also the displacement of this conflict by its appeal to a more kind of unifying theory it seeks to articulate the reproduction of gender within what Marxist, femini Marxist and Marxist feminists would call the social totality, obviously, framing the problem at the scale of capitalist value relations as a whole. Yet its specific historical developments, uh, specifically in the 60s and 70s, have been notoriously criticized for producing their own versions of this bad universalizing. So while in some cases, gender itself was subsumed under more quote unquote total concerns, the tendency of such theory to universalize and essentialize the category woman, as we know, notoriously produced issues of sexuality, of race, and also sometimes of class as localized and particularized as kind of supplementary elements that could then appear as mere issues of what people often pejoratively call identity politics. So intersectional responses to second wave feminism sought to overcome this dual problem of, on the one hand, universalization, and on the other hand, this kind of, that comes with it, a supplementation, by destabilizing the notion of identity, theorizing how experience of individuals is made up of mutually constituting and kind of interlocking systems and structures of oppression. However, such approaches have sometimes had trouble articulating what the relation between these different systems and structures is, and thus formulating the individual as a kind of localized site of oppression or the locus through which these distinct forms of oppression intersect. And in doing so, it tends towards an elision of the question of the reproduction of such structures. The resulting disavowal of the need for a unifying 
or totalizing horizon, which can help us to mediate particular struggles, can have the effect of collapsing uh, struggle down into individual rights-based issues, admittedly now of a more kind of varied and complicated nature. So current debates uh, within Marxist feminism and more widespread intersectional perspectives attempt to see beyond the divide between socio-economic analysis and identity critique by both assuming an intersectional premise while insisting upon the mediation of so-called identity struggles through a more critical conception of the social totality. Um, for Kevin Floyd, for example, who I'll be coming back to later, critical totality thinking can be used to define a set of structural logics which render social relationships both unifying and contradictory by necessity. So this paper um, will be just trying to pose a few kind of central preliminary questions. First of all, does a concept of uh, totality as the articulation of a structural logic remain necessary for, for feminist theory and struggle that aims to navigate the inherent, perhaps irreducible tensions and fracturing of identity-based political struggle? And if so, what formulation, or uh, how can we under, what kind of understanding or grasp of this concept of totality would we need for, to, to be kind of adequate to the complexities of um, these struggles? So I guess we've been trying to think about the way in which, the way in which um, our theoretical framework and tools that we utilize um, actually sets up the problematic of the horizon of struggle and whether, whether certain kinds of frameworks or certain kinds of thinking are more or less amenable to assisting us to understand and to navigate, but obviously not to eradicate completely, um, moments of unity and fracturing within, kind of so within movements and groups. Okay, so the next, the next section of this, um, this project, as instantiated right here, is um, sort of a potted history of the relationship between universality and totality in uh, feminism. And perhaps more, more broadly, just a kind of uh, diagrammatic account. So in a way you could set it up as a, as a standoff between the idea of the right to have rights, as Hannah Arendt phrases it, to between equal rights forced aside in Marx. So the difference between liberal feminism and socialist or Marxist feminism can be succinctly encapsulated through their different approaches to the category of universality as a horizon for political articulations, for making political claims. The difference between these approaches has its own histories and contradictions but can broadly be mapped onto the one between liberal and radical democratic perspectives and Marxist ones more generally. So the feminist one can be mapped onto that one. Universality is held to be the keystone of a rights-based approach concerned with social inclusion, with gaining recognition in civil society and, and the state. The conception of the whole, which animates this perspective, 
is comparable to a bourgeois public sphere, and the universal is accessed through a formal and ideally substantive equality of rights. The radical democratic perspective of someone like Hannah Arendt, who draws a sharp line between the visibility that correlates with the publicness of the political in the um, agora, in the marketplace, and the um, insignificance and repetitiveness of the private realm would fit into this trajectory, the private realm being the domestic realm, would fit into this trajectory as well as the work of political theorists such as John Rawls and Martha Nussbaum, or even the post-Marxists Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau. What takes the form of a substantive rights framework is often summed up in Arendt's very uh, pithy aphorism that she used to describe the situation of displaced or stateless persons after World War II that they lacked the right to have rights, that is, they were deprived of access to the means of recognition issued by the nation state or international agencies, which would enable them to exercise, sorry, which would enable them to exercise the human rights, which were the only legal instrument that they had as refugees, but without the ability to exercise it, it was a very abstract um, right. So this legislative contractual framework has been subjected to critique not only by Marxian social theory, but by Marxian legal theory, uh, such as Evgeny Pashikhanis, as well as socialist feminist legal scholars such as Carol Pateman, and more recently by Angela Metropolis. This framework is the basic architecture of liberal universalism, which unfolds in the realm of formal political demands and the political demand, the nature of the political demand, is our chief concern here as it relates to social movements and how they can formulate demands. There are important conversations to be had, of course, with regard to philosophical universalism, such as those emanating from 18th century Enlightenment philosophy and its Kantian legacies, and their relationship to racism, colonialism, and in fact, the constitution of gender and sexual normativity in modern times. From this, the chief line drawn by Marxists to separate their analysis as a materialist one from what they deem to be the formalism of universality is the preference for the category of totality. Totality refers to a certain logical notion of synthesis, which is constituted of antagonisms, contradictions, and structural determinations which are mediated in various ways. This synthesis is often understood to be capital as a relation rather than a thing and it's a process that is articulated differently in different geographical and historical circumstances and for different subjects and collectivities, but with certain distinctive patterns, such as commodity, money, class, labor, which distinguish capitalist societies historically and spatially. The category of totality is drawn from Hegel by Marx and describes society as a set of interlocking parts whose relationships are mediated through some axioms of social and economic power that are able to dominate the whole, again, uh, such as capital. No aspect of this social whole can be understood in isolation from the rest. So the category of the totality is supposed to allow us to view the so to speak, surface appearances, as Marx says, of capitalist society in ways that understand those appearances to arise from the deeper workings of the social whole. And this serves to reinforce the importance of viewing capital not as a thing, but as, as a social relation.
So finally, carrying on from this very short summary of universalism as the right to have rights, we can sum up the shift to the more materialist viewpoint and Marxism as going beyond that notion of rights or the ability to exercise nominal rights with the phrase, between equal rights, force decides. Which is to say the legislative framework may dictate formal equality whether in the distribution or the exercise of rights. And so here we can think of Hannah Arendt's ancient Greek stage of the Agora as the proper site for politics, um, and contrast that to Marx's comments on the clear and open light of the marketplace as being the stage for formal equality amongst buyers and sellers of commodities. But for Marxists, it's what happens in the hidden abode of production, or for Marxist feminists, the hidden abode of reproduction as well, or primarily, which is important for seeing whose universal rights can concretely be actualized. So in this way, does a critical grasp of the totality allow us to understand the distinction between formal rights and the uneven distribution of their realization? A totality is composed of uneven power relations from the beginning. So equal rights, in other words, arise out of a social field that is always already contradictory and is premised on exploitation not a level playing field, which is contingently biased and where rights can be accessed by nominally equal actors. So basically the rights-based frameworks that characteristic of universalism can seem inadequate to address the public and private split, which most radical and materialist feminism sees as the basis of gender depression which is to say the maintenance of a public sphere of politics and the sphere of nature to which women and other non-men, non-whites are allocated and where their labor is made invisible and devalued. Many Marxist feminists in fact argue that Marx himself maintained that split by not giving political or theoretical significance to reproductive labor. And here we can point to 1970s, 1980s Marxist feminists like Leopoldina Fortunati and Lisa Vogel as thinkers who tried to provide a systematic account of the significance, although from very distinct theoretical departure points of autonomous Marxism on the one hand and a structuralist or Althusserian influenced socialist feminism. Contemporary writers such as Endnotes have continued the project of theorizing gender using the optic of value relations to flesh out the role of gender in a totalizing capital relation rather than as part of a system, a separate system called patriarchy, for example. The fact that totalizing, so to speak, totalizing or unifying theories have been privileged by Marxist feminist then and now puts them at some remove, at least programmatically, from intersectional approaches. The analysis afforded by keeping a horizon of totality in view is by, argued by Marxist feminists to be stronger than the, so to speak, locational method of intersectionality, which appears to have trouble articulating different moments of oppression together and can end up falling back on different systems, such as racism, patriarchy, heteronormativity, ableism, classism. Although a distinction can be drawn between so-called additive and so-called dynamic models of intersectionality, and the distinction between Marxist feminism and intersectional approaches can often get quite blurry on the le in the strategic level of organizing in the recent period. 
It is clear that the need for a totalizing horizon is not experienced in the same way by proponents of intersectionality and proponents of Marxist feminism. However critically acute intersectional discussions of the historically and spatially various modes of oppression and the resonances or co-determinations between them might be. Also, intersectionality's origins in the legal framework can, though necess do not necessarily, mean that the universalist rights-based horizon remains the ultimate target of demands informed by this kind of analysis. We can say that intersectional approaches do now form a certain common sense in many forms of radical theory and political movements, including critical race theory, queer theory, trans theory, as well as decolonial and indigenous theory and politics, and are explicitly articulated in movements such as Black Lives Matter. This is due in part to the fact that the legacy of Marxist feminism, while attractive for its ability to offer a totalizing analysis, which mediates the different locations and experiences of social violence and systematic exclusion is one which has shown great difficulties historically in theorizing race and sexuality, and this boosts the case for intersectional approaches. In her argument for social reproduction feminism's totalizing capacities, Sue Ferguson argues, however, that the historical and sociological complexity of many contemporary intersectional approaches remains abstract, since it cannot point to a logic which brings the different instances of oppression into relation. Thus, intersections can only ever be random without an integrative logic and supplementing the analysis with historical explanation is not always enough to resolve this. History without a logic can still just be random. For Ferguson, importantly, while capital may form the linchpin of the totality for Marxism in general, for social reproduction feminism, the unifying category is labor, which she calls an integrative ontology of labor. This, of course, can also be problematized in many ways. So we can say finally that the Marx, finally for this section, <laughs> that the Marxist feminist suspicion of universalism as a horizon for making political claims, for example, in liberal or equality feminism, is in many ways recapitulating Marx's doubts about the substantiveness of Hegel's philosophy of right. And this yields a commitment to the category of totality. Once Marxist feminism has overcome or set aside its uh, deep problems with the dual systems approach in the 70s and 80s. And then this commitment to totality is itself questioned by intersectional approaches in their, in their commitment to the irreducibility of frameworks of oppression to one another, and thus a rejection of a dominant social logic or explanation that mediates these as concrete instances. However, in its turn, the commitment to the irreducibility of different situated struggles does not necessarily imply a commitment to difference, whether that's theoretically or strategically, as we can see with Kevin Floyd's recuperation of the category of totality in his book, Queer Marxism. And that, that is enunciated in part to avoid what he calls the reification and normalization of desire which he suspects that a politics informed by difference can end up succumbing to, just as in, in the way they end up succumbing to universalism or the state as the factual, actual mediator of particular differences in the pursuit of rights-based claims. Yeah. 
So despite the apparent potential of the category, it's precisely this emphasis within Marxism upon thinking a totality of social relations that's produced deep skepticism towards the capacity of of the framework to meaningfully articulate issues of gender, race, and sexuality. And obviously the image of totalizing systems uh, has accrued famously negative, really negative kind of theoretical and also political connotations, um, often being associated with a tendency within, which is kind of inherent within modernism towards the total organization, management and control of societies. Um, societies which are conceptualized as these kind of unified, coherent wholes, constructed of universal subject citizens. Um, a tendency which is often seen to have reached a logical conclusion in the political movements of the 20th century and its total wars. And the theoretical framework of totality operative within, I'm gonna uh, be brief now because I've just been given the five minute mark. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sum up, sort of. Um, so regarding sexuality, Kevin Floyd has suggested that it's precisely this Marxian tendency to subordinate questions of sexuality to more total concerns representing these issues and their politics as already localized and particularized, which to a large extent framed and conditioned uh, queer thought as it emerged in the 1990s. And a similar story could also be told of the emergence of specific forms of radical black and materialist feminisms in the 70s. Um, and then obviously like leading later being consolidated into the analysis of uh, intersectionality. But I guess the point would be that um, this dual movement of the subsuming character, if, if, if your concept of totality is too crude, uh, such that it subsumes all of these other moments uh, and produces them as supplementary to it, as though it is a pre-given object, um, then not only do we misunderstand these different moments, but we misunderstand what, what the concept of social totality is. So Marx would call it an imagined concrete or a chaotic conception of the whole. Um, so capitalism would be a really good example of uh, a totality which is subject to this slippage, um, often utilized not just to talk about a mode of production, but literally everything that there is. When we say like, it's all capitalism or it's all, you know, this. Um, so I'm just gonna skip some bits because I don't have much time, but I guess the point is to say that this is not simply an issue of theory or theoretical precision, but rather the capacity for a unifying theory, this concept seems to bring with it a risk of a kind of radical indeterminacy when thought in relation to concrete politics. So we need to be able to specify what the, the kind of limit, the, the boundaries and what, what it is that we're actually talking about, um, but to also be able to make uh, present totality in the way that Marx means it, which would be what he calls the unity of the diverse. And it's exactly this equa equating of uh, a kind of internal differentiation 
in Marx's notion of totality that makes it amenable to think, to think uh, about kind of uh, difference in a, in a adequate way. So for the theorist Kevin Floyd, totality is a epistemological category and one that needs to be thought as speculative and critical, not just in a something that's assumed to exist. In his account, the greatest producer of difference, of atomization and of reification are the social relations of capital, which means that no radical materialist politics can afford to dispense with a rig rigorously negative practice of totality thinking, as opposed to a kind of crude or positive version of which Marxism has long been accused. So Kevin Floyd reformulates the role of totality thinking as a regulative political category, not as simply something that exists in reality that we have to kind of discover. And this operates at the level of epistemological transformation. So what this means is that by starting from our discrete positions, our individual positions and experiences, yet retaining a firm commitment to try to unify, to understand uh, how all of these moments of social life that have been atomized by capitalist relations uh, are actually connected. We can avoid an overly static conception and that this process is imperfectible for Kevin Floyd. Just for Kevin Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for us, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, tying things up quite brutally. Um, <laughs> Given everything that we've said here and all the sort of things we haven't been able to say, what implications could this have for political strategy, which is kind of our main concern through, the, through this historical, logical excursus? The way in which we give shape, uh, both theoretically and effectively, to the horizon of struggle, uh, whether explicitly or implicitly, has bearing on how we navigate moments of unity and diversity within those struggles. Does the way we prioritize certain modes of oppression, of domination, of exploitation in our analysis generates, generate a specific practice, one which faces challenges in practicing solidarities? The divisions can seem as if they're just multiplying. If identity politics gets accused of dividing class politics, class politics is just as prone to, so to speak, divide identity politics. In fact, there have been a number of criticisms arising recently and not so recently, that the relationship of class politics to the, so to speak, totality can also be quite superficial, making class politics a form of identity politics in its exclusionary sense. Or can we, can we actually project the horizon of totality in which different forms are experienced as inseparable aspects of a geographically, historically rooted unifying logic rather than as, rather than as contingently related to one another? So can, in that case, totality be thought as a missing dimension that is capable of knitting together the tendencies of movements to splinter and fracture around their exclusion? So totality not as a premise, not as an assumption, but something which is built through struggle. Or is the problem rather of our, the articulation of analogous but irreducible logics, as intersectionality would argue? We can reframe that question if we consider as the um, writer and artist Hannah Black says, quote, how a gendered and racialized capitalism produces and deploys individual subjects as part of the violent apparatus of value. So just final seconds. In current debates between some varieties of Marxist feminism and the more widespread intersectional perspectives, using the framework of totality, allows us to define structural logics that produce social relationships as both unifying and contradictory, rather than the intersection of identity categories of oppression. However, at the same time, there are still problems with seeing socially transformative politics as relying on the presence of structural unities rather than 
as a contingent subjectifying process that comes out of a social field characterized by division, as Floyd already emphasized. Um, so he will conclude just with a passage from our, um, the writer Chris Chen, who argues, quote, from the point of view of emancipation, a social order freed from racial and gender domination would not necessarily spell the end of identity as such, but rather of ascriptive processes so deeply bound up with the historical genesis and trajectory of global capitalism that the basic categories of collective sociality would be transformed beyond recognition. Um, that's it, thank you. <laughs>